it is so befitting to have uh, Sri Javagal Srinath to speak to all of us uh, for this uh, finale of this course on excellence in leadership. And I would uh, request uh, Dr. Sundar Sarukai, my colleague and the greatest fan of cricket. And uh, I mean, cricket lives in Niyas because of Sundar. And everybody likes cricket, but Sundar has been the kind of the spokesperson of cricket all these years. So I thought Dr. Saruka is the best person to conduct this session and introduce Javagal Srinath Sundar. Thank you, Sangeeta. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have all of you. And what a way to end our, begin the ending of our session of the course on excellence and leadership uh, by having Mr. Javagal Srinath with us. It's indeed a great pleasure to have him with us. Uh, both officially and also at the personal level. There are, as you see, many new people in the audience today, and uh, rarely they come to many of the talks in our courses, but today you can see Mr. Srinath's uh, appeal transcends uh, people, whether they are in different disciplines and different human activities. Um, Mr. Srinath needs very little introduction. Um, but I have to do my job in doing that. And I want to connect it to something very important about this course on excellence in leadership. If in India today there is any activity which demands both excellence and leadership, among the very many activities, among the many speakers you've heard, it's indeed sports. And among sports, among all the different sporting activities, it's indeed cricket, which seems to be the flag bearer in a very literal sense. The Indian idea of nationalism is very much catalyzed by, I think, the activities on and off the cricket field. And who best to exemplify it other than Mr. Srinath? And I can also see that for people who have been in the eye of television, for people whom we have seen throughout in the television, dissected, looked at in slow motion and at short, very sure, you know, close focus and so on. It's indeed a very different experience to see them uh, in flesh. And I'm sure that there are a lot of questions which we wanted to ask to the TV screen or to the TV commentators, which we couldn't. It gives us an opportunity now to ask Mr. Srinath much of what we uh, wanted to ask about sports in general, about cricket in particular, and perhaps about uh, his own performances. As all of you know, he was uh, one of India's greatest fast bowlers until his retirement in late 2003. And although we now seem to be coming up with a breed of fast bowlers, he was one of the few genuinely quick bowlers acknowledged all over the world. Uh, interestingly, his background is he's born and brought up in Mysore, and he obtained a BE degree from Mysore University from the Sri Jayacham Rajendra College of Engineering, which for those of you who know about engineering, disciplines know it's one of the premier colleges of engineering in Karnataka. He made his test debut against Australia at Brisbane in 1991-92, and his one-day international debut in the Wills Trophy at Sharjah that year. He has a remarkable record for a fast bowler bowling in Indian conditions, as we always keep hearing, uh, not very friendly Indian conditions. He has, uh, in 67 test, test after that, he has captured 236 wickets at a remarkable average of 30.49, and his best figures have been eight for 86. He has many times claimed five wickets in a test innings, which is like, as you know, making a century or more. Um, one of the advantages of being a bowler is that uh, more than getting wickets, when they hit runs, it's always a double source of pleasure. And Mrs. Srinath has accomplished himself very greatly in batting too. Uh, uh, he has scored over 1,000 runs. He has 1,009 runs with a, in test cricket with the highest score of 76. He has an exemplary record in one, test one-day internationals too. Um, what is very interesting about his, uh, his capacity to bowl on Indian wickets is that his average at home is well exemplified by the fact that his average at home is in fact superior to his average away from India. And uh, given that for a fast bowler, that's one of the most unique um, statistics which you can, which say something about the dedication of a fast bowler. He has of course played for various counties in UK, Gloucestershire and Leicestershire. He retired in 
international cricket from international cricket after the 2003 world cup in south africa he has also been as many of you would have seen a commentator uh, but now i hear he has been made a match referee for uh, international uh, match selected as a match referee by the international cricket council from last year if i'm right and if i remember right he's just come back from kenya where he officiated as a match referee in some matches there so i i think it's a great pleasure to have him um, both not just as an icon of indian cricket and as an icon of karnataka with lot of people in karnataka would like to take him as our own but also because uh, there is something in his attitude towards the game that reflects the central theme of this course uh, the no notion of excellence in leadership mr sri Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would say that I'm a little intimidated when I went through the entire profile: <laughs> the IAS officers, the directors, and <clears throat> I think in times of uh, time and experience, I think I have a very short career of uh, say 15 years of first-class cricket. But I think your careers are probably uh, still going on, and it will go on for some more time. So, uh, and the capacities with which you are, I mean, the, the positions what you hold is. Uh, probably your experience is more valuable and um <clears throat> that's the reason is little intimidating i thought of uh, to be honest in kenya um i was doing a triangular series between kenya scotland and uh, um canada so this presentation was coming to my mind and um, mr devraj had gave me a little profile about who is going to be here so i was wondering what should i present i thought and thought and then finally i said it's better that i have an interactive session there is no need for me to put anything on the uh, on the screen which i have done in couple of places um, for couple of companies about what team work is all about and what leadership is all about but i think for this gathering it is better that i have an interactive session because there is more for me to learn from you people than <laughs> you know me talking about it but the uniqueness of uh, my profession is that uh, that i have seen this profession right from the beginning and i'm kind of retired which not many people have you and that's probably one place where i have uh, something up one up against you people um <clears throat> so in this game of cricket um, well before that uh, mr sundar gave a uh, brief understanding about uh, what uh, in depth or detailed uh, my professional outlook i mean now i'm i do a bit of match refereeing as well and uh, which i thought while playing it was a very cushy job where you sit and just monitor the game but uh, having taken up the game and having taken up this profession and having gone through this for almost 6 months i've done three series now here i understand that uh, this is a real global one you have umpires from different countries you have uh, players from different countries so it's basically uh, the true globalization in my work experience is this one um, the job of match referee um, from the macro level if you see it um, number 1 is to monitor the conduct of the players number 2 is to monitor the conduct of the umpires number 3 is to monitor the uh, relationship between the players and the umpires um and then you take the entire security into account you also make sure that the hotel the travel the food everything is okay for the player so it's quite a bit of responsibility the match referee can only make a name uh, when there is a controversy i'm sure you must have gone through all these things otherwise i don't think if the match smoothly progresses without any problems that means the match referee is unheard of if at all he wants to probably come into the forefront <clears throat> that means there is some trouble so it's a real challenge and it has really opened my eyes and um, i think uh, it requires true management skills to handle the umpires uh, it requires a tremendous um, uh, communication skills to manage the players you got to be talking to the players all the time to to have their conduct uh, in place 
So uh, it's, it's really interesting and uh, I, I feel that every series when I go and do it and come back, uh, I feel that I probably still don't know so many things that is uh, hidden in this uh, job. So it's very interesting. <clears throat> well, coming back to my uh, little stint um, in this game, I was extremely fortunate to have played this game. The first thing that uh, whenever we go abroad or even in India uh, is that why is cricket being given all the adulation, why not the other sport? That's one. And number two is that uh, why don't we perform um, consistently um, throughout? I mean, Australia has hit a wonderful chord. I mean, they're unbeatable at this point in time. English had that kind of... Uh, advantage in this world of cricket for quite some time in the mid 70s and early 80s. Then we had um, <coughs> West Indies having a lean, I mean, a wonderful patch of almost six years where they dominated the world cricket. But why is that India cannot do it? I think this is the question that has been asked uh, every now and then. I think the problem, I would not say a problem, but um, uh, we, I mean, our culture we don't have a sporting culture, basically. When I say we don't have a sporting culture, I think uh, the next uh, line that would be, we don't take sport as a profession. We can't afford to take sport as a profession. Don't think our economy allows uh, to take sport as a profession. Except for cricket, there is no other sport uh, which can support somebody throughout his life. And even in cricket, I think uh, maybe thousands or millions of people uh, play this game, but only 11 can get a chance to play in the 11. Uh, 11 can get a chance to play for the country. So uh, the way we play this game is with tremendous insecurity. Uh, right from the childhood days, I mean, I there are very few people, except for lone exception being Anil Kumble, uh, in my opinion, that who wanted to play for India and who played for India. I think most of them would probably well, I'm playing this game, let me test my luck, how far I can go, how far I can progress. Or oh, in the bargain, if I play for India, well and good, otherwise it's okay, you know. That's the attitude what we have. And uh, I don't think that's the right way to go about, uh, uh, you know, playing this game, I mean, at the international level. So that insecurity is whatever that we go through in the, um, in, in the process of playing for the country. I think that kind of stands up when we are there at the international level, uh, when you play at the international level, the highest level. So I would say sometimes our fundamentals are very weak uh, when you compare it to Australia or, or in England or South Africa or, or any of these uh, countries. So I really don't have an answer for that. I know why we, why we can't make this a profession. In that case, I would give an example, simple structure of what happens in Australia. If somebody decides to become a swimmer, I think at the age of 12, 14, he joins an academy, which is a professional academy. From then on, it will be swimming, which will be his main activity. Education becomes his secondary. And that's how he progresses. So he gets the best facilities, he gets the best uh, nutrition, he gets the best technology available for him, he gets the best coach. His whole pro, uh, uh, you know, objective of life from there for the next five years will be swimming. So is cricket, so is any other sport. Whereas in India, I think it is always education. It is education, education, education. Now, sport is just an entertainment part. I think we still give an entertainment uh, title to the sport. It is not a, a, a profession uh, at all. Not many people can take that. At the same time, when you take it as a profession, I think we got to ignore our education. In our country, if you miss out on the crucial periods from 18 to 21, and if you probably channelize all your energy towards cricket, you can never ever come back into the normal stream profession again. I think you have missed out on it. This is the fear which really hampers the preparation uh, of any cricketer uh, to become an international player. So, uh, you know, I hope, uh, I think you can ask me any question in between. I think that would probably be the best way if at all you have anything in your mind. Um, do you agree that sport, would you allow your kids, or maybe your grandkids, if at all, to, to become a cricketer? 
professionally, vis-a-vis -vis education. <clears throat> See, this is what, I mean, this is very true. Yeah. And then we expect India to be the topmost professionals uh, and win games for us, so, which is not that easy. Um, <clears throat> but the best part about this profession is that uh, there are a lot of drives within us which kind of uh, uh, which is enabled every now and then and that is basically because we are assessed real time uh, I think this is one of the unique advantage what cricketers have I think what we do our performance is analyzed by millions of people then and there itself um, which is uh, it's just pretty challenging. Now, unless otherwise you have your fundamentals right, you, you have your uh, you know the thought process, you the way you see the game on the long run. You don't have all these things in place. I think the criticisms is the first one which can really take you down straight away. And um, it is not easy when you're written off in the newspaper the next day saying that okay, he's not fit enough, he's not good enough to play. I think he should be thrown out of the side. Um, it's never easy. I mean, that's probably the reason why uh, the players, most of them need education or, or probably uh, good analytical skills to continue this game. <coughs> and um, okay, now this is basically, I just wanted to set a, a, some kind of context to this entire thing. So you basically understand why there is a bit of inconsistency in the Indian cricket and uh, why cricket is not a profession in this in this in this part of the world and um, in spite of it I think we have some exceptional uh, players uh, who still probably lead the world <clears throat> in my cricketing experience I had a uh, lot of uh, uh, you know I was extremely lucky to play under several captains uh, to start off with I played under Azhar and then uh, it was Sachin then again it was Azur for a couple of years, and then again, again it was Sachin, and then again uh, it was Saurav Ganguly. So we played under five different captains. You can also say Sachin when he came back for the second stint, he was a different captain altogether, so you can take him as another new captain in that sense. So we had almost five captains um, under whom we, under whom I played this, uh, this game. Each one of them had their own style. Nobody was similar. And uh, the way they played their games, um, and uh, the way they connected to the people, their understanding of team was different. But from 91 to 2003, I think the captains have evolved. Their approach towards the game is completely different for the good of the game, for the good of the players. I would probably see two things in a leader. Um, I would say one is interpersonal skills. It's the way he deals with the with the player, the way he deals with the game itself, um, the way he connects to the players professionally, the way he connects to the players personally. That we are talking about the interpersonal skills. And the other one is about the intrapersonal uh, skills of a captain. What captain is made up of? Uh, for example, we. I mean, I can categorize this into two things. One is the physical side of it. That means how good a batsman he is, how good a bowler he is as a captain. I mean, as a cricketer, it's the core competence of this player. How good uh, a batsman is Saurav Ganguly, or how good a cap batsman is Sachin Tandulkar. But I think more to that, this is a basic necessary condition for him to be the captain, but more to it is the non-physical side, which could be his emotions which could be his uh, spirits, which could be his temperament. And these are the factors, I think, which really guide uh, this dynamic sport, and especially in the leadership space. And um, <clears throat> everybody, Azar, Sachin, Saurav, um, or to some extent, I think Kapil was also a part of the team, although he was not the captain, but he was also a part of the team. So um, you know, even Vingsakar and Srikanth were <clears throat> the part of the team in the earlier uh, side of it. So, each one of them have their unique style of functioning and uh, you can never probably put two together and say, okay, they were similar in their operations. Let us talk about Azhar and his leadership skills. <coughs> well, 
you know, we had this debacle in 2000 about this match fixing, which was extremely unfortunate. Uh, I would say this is probably one of the gray areas um, of, of cricket and probably um, which, which really the game took a lot of beating. But uh, I think the game is so much uh, within, assimilated within ourselves that the game has come back clean and it is played clean now. So uh, there was a stage where there was a lot of learning that happened during that particular uh, period of time for all the players who were playing in the side. Uh, it wasn't probably, if you ask me, the most difficult time is not to establish myself uh, in the Indian team or not to bowl on a flat wicket, but to go through this period. I think it was probably the most difficult period for all the cricketers who were there in the, uh, in the side. Uh, justice was done, I think. Uh, some of them got their uh, punishment. Uh, you don't have to go behind bars, but uh, the humiliation itself is good enough. Uh, well, talking about Azhar's uh, uh, style of captaincy, he was extremely a good person. He would never say no to anyone. Um, you know, very uh, gullible, vulnerable. Anybody can go, especially if you're a senior in the side, you can go and get your things done. And that could happen at the cost of a junior. He didn't really bother about that. As long as the seniors were okay. And now, when Asar was captain, you had uh, probably the best. Now, this is my own experience, what I'm speaking. I'm not trying to put anybody down here. I think there are good sides of our captains. There are, you know, few gray areas of our captains. So don't mistake me in saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to put on upon anybody here, but I think I'm trying to be very frank and open with people. Under Azhar, when I started playing, it was Kapil, Vengsakar and Srikanth. All of them were captains. And um, the, the problem was that the, the seniors um, almost ruled the show. The seniors got whatever they wanted, but that never percolated down to the, uh, uh, to the juniors. I think there was a big void and there was no way that uh, anybody was kind of uh, made felt that you're also a part of the team. Some amount of uh, isolation did happen during those periods, especially for the juniors. Now there were exceptions. Sachin Tendulkar was a lone exception. You know, he was probably the blue boy and uh, blue-eyed boy of the team and he was accepted everywhere. But uh, then the players had to really work hard to get some recognition. They really had to do something extraordinary on the field to do that. Now, when you enter Indian cricket team, I think as an youngster, you really don't know what's your roles and responsibility overall. All you do is just give me the ball, I will go and bow. All I do is, you know, I need to go make sure that uh, my 10 over spell has to be good. Or if you give me a ball in a test match situation, I will have to go and... There were no efforts uh, to kind of align our thoughts to the team's uh, gains. That never happened when, when, when we played as juniors, myself, Anil, or anybody for that matter. But the best points of Azhar was that you go one-on-one -on -one and say that whether it is for your own good or you're playing games with Azhar, you go and seek anything, he would say yes to that. So there was some kind of leniency uh, whether you want it or whether you don't want it, you can misuse it if you want it. And uh, there was some kind of, uh, you know, uh, I would say high-handedness uh, when he handled these juniors with respect to the seniors. I think the seniors got most of it, but uh, the juniors kind of, I'm not talking when you, when you say, and I say got most of it, I'm talking about it from the game's point of view, not materialistically. Um, so that was Azar and uh, not so assertive. Uh, but a good man uh, on the field. Never, uh, he let the things happen on his own course. Uh, if it happened good, fair enough. Uh, if it didn't happen, then it really didn't matter. So he was very soon, he used to be uh, philosophical about the whole thing. Yeah, Bhagwan, I said, yeah, that's what we're going to get. And that's, that's, he always resented the face very quickly. And that was uh, as a, but I think, um, as an youngster, uh, I looked up to him and uh, in the initial part of my career, when I just entered the team, I think one-on-one um, -on -one he was an excellent guy. But how much that 
really translated onto the field, uh, maybe I was also a little ignorant to pick up those points from, uh, from the leaders. After that, we had Sachin Tandulkar who came into the uh, fray. He was more of a, a power uh, leadership, actually. What he may have kind of wanted was to demand, command respect from each and every one. And um, he was never transactional. There was no give and take. When I say something, you just do it. There is not even an inch given to uh, kind of negotiate or probably to bargain. No, this is what I want. This is what I feel, um, you know, the, the weakness of the opponents and this is what you need to bow. Uh, I think the way he passionately connected to the game was tremendous. Uh, there is no question about his connection to the game. But I think nobody got any flexibility uh, during uh, his tenure. Uh, it was like um, Imran Khan. I think he idolized Imran Khan. But the problem with, uh, well, well, the reason why Imran Khan was such a successful captain was because Pakistan team, if you really see, there is one language which they really understand under Imran. It was abusive. Extremely abusive language on the field. It worked. And it was only Imran Khan who could do this. I can also talk about what Wazim Akram did. He, when he took over the captaincy from Imran Khan, he tried the same tactics and it could never happen. The guys kind of gang back and then, you know, the infights and they didn't like the way he operated. I think Imran Khan was the lone exception which he could do it because he led by very high standards. And he used to say that uh, unless otherwise I use this language, I mean, there is no way that these guys are going to listen to me. And he was right on most of the occasion when he said, okay, this is what you need to bowl. I don't want anything else. Of course, with a lot of abusive language around it, it never used to be a straight communication. So that was Imran Khan. So I think Sachin idealized Imran Khan more. And then under Azhar, he always thought that Azhar was not assertive. So he straight away kind of embraced Imran Khan's uh, you know, power leadership. And then it was quite a, he never understood the talent and how to harness the talent from, from the youngsters. I think a lot of them were intimidated. They were scared uh, to perform under Sachin. I mean, the day they performed, it was okay. But if they don't, I think they didn't even have the guts to see him in the face. I think, uh, you know, as I said, when you grow up with so much of insecurities with respect to the game, and then still your talent takes you to the highest level. And then when you are about to face a, a leader uh, who is extremely tough. I don't think uh, you, your your drives or will enable you to stand and then think, you know, uh, think for your own cricket. I mean, you can't. So then, what you do, you surrender yourself to the captain and say, okay, whatever you do, I will. Whatever you say, I'm going to do it. So in doing that, I think the natural ability of the players kind of eroded. A lot of fast bowlers. Um, under Sachin, because they, they didn't bowl what they could, what they knew the best. You know, they were trying to say, okay, what what is that you want me to bowl to this man? I mean, so their own self thinking, uh, you know, they they doubted their own self thinking. I mean, they thought, well, this is probably not the best way to do. I will just speak to Sachin, and then he will tell me what to bowl to this man. So half the time, you know, their own energies, I mean, their own thought process uh, never existed. It was always Sachin's thoughts on the mind of the players and that that kind of uh, eroded their natural ability to perform. So that was Sachin on most of the occasions because Sachin could bowl, he could bat, he could you know spin, he could do everything. He used to come to me and say, come on, I want you to bowl an out swinger. I said, I cannot, my body doesn't allow this to happen. He said, no, you have to bowl. I can bowl, why can't you bowl? I said, no, it is not possible. My body, I mean, I have a unique physique. Why don't you think a little deeper? I can bowl an in swinger, but I cannot bowl an out swinger. My body doesn't allow me to do this. You don't want to do this. <laughs> now, we used to probably have a, a, a dead end in such conversations every now and then. But I think hearts of hearts, he kind of appreciated this kind of uh, uh, arguments. Because I knew my limitations and I said, this is exactly what I do. And he, even with Sunil, I said, you know, why don't you turn the ball a little more? Now, that doesn't happen, actually, if you really see the game. You, I mean, Anil's uh, forte is accuracy and, uh, and variation in the speed. It is not turn. So you cannot just go and ask him to, okay, turn that extra bit, because he could do it. 
the reason is that, I mean, when we talk about his intrapersonal skills, his core content, his core, uh, uh, you know, the game was so good, he expected everybody to be on the same levels, which was not possible. This was Sachin for the first uh, couple of years. And, and then slowly he realized that that was costing his own game and then captaincy changed. Then Azar came back into the hot seat. Things didn't change much. Azar was just the usual self. He wouldn't change as it is. It was just the same. And again, Sachin took over from Azar again in, in the 1998. Now this time, I think Sachin was probably uh, more matured in his approach. I think he gave a lot of freedom for, for the players to operate. Uh, he allowed uh, uh, people to come and speak to him and then he, he probably started listening to, to the players. The first time, um, you know, when he became the captain and, and, and the second time when he came back as a, a renewed captain, I think there was a lot of difference in his approach towards the game. Although he was a little adamant about his, you know, the way the thing should go, but uh, the, in, in overall, the way he handled the youngsters was far, far better. So uh, this was Sachin uh, till now, and then <clears throat> I think the, the 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 drawback of Sachin's captaincy would be his temperament. Uh, uh, actually, he didn't like to lose. The day he lost, I think it would have been. Uh, severe on the boys. Um, I think uh, some players, I think when they lose, I think they prepare better for the next game. But some of them, I think they just go down. I think they just, uh, uh, they cannot really recoup and come back again. And uh, Sachin was somebody who hated to lose and we lost most of the games and there were a lot of chopping and changing that used to happen and uh, that really didn't work for the team well. But the thing about Sachin was that he was extremely passionate and if he liked someone, I think that happens to everyone, we all, we all have our likes and dislikes. I think he gave that extra long uh, rope to them, but uh, with some I think he was extremely short-sighted. Um, but I think the second time when he came, he was a far better captain. Of all the captains I have played, I think Saurav was probably the best captain. Um, he understood uh, his core competence, what exactly he could deliver. He understood his weaknesses and accordingly, he kind of worked with everyone. I mean, in India, I think, uh, I, I don't know, you, you can correct me if you're wrong. If you, people can participate, you can just ask me questions if, if you have any in your mind. The best way to kind of get the best out of uh, the players is when you lower yourself, you only lower your level and then stand on the play same platform uh, of, uh, of the player. For example, I think uh, he was largely instrumental in building Yuvraj Singh. He was largely instrumental in building Zahir Khan. He was largely instrumental in building another uh, few cricketers, which was, uh, you know, fantastic. Um, the key for Saurav's success as a, I would say, the best captain India has ever produced, um, is that if I have something, he was ready for an argument. If I had, he allowed people to have an unfiltered argument with the captain. So that didn't take away, you know, his position as a captain, but he allowed people to have that freedom. So if I have to say something, you come and say it. You mean, he was always uh, available. You can say what you're doing is wrong. We got to probably take the, to take the other route. He would say yes. Most of the times we used to say when you win the toss, we got to bat first. And then there was, used to be an argument. So he has his own cases. So he allowed the people to participate and then decide why we want to bat or why we want to bowl. So finally, he was good in convincing people and he used to get it done. But there was some kind of consensus, but it was not a biased consensus. It was a very healthy consensus that happened on, on most of the occasions. Okay, he kind of delegated a lot of things. He never held anything to himself. He said, okay, bowling department, Anil and Srinath, you take care of it. Batting, Rahul, Sachin, you take care of the batsmen. So there was... You know, it was easy. I mean, we never saw him as a captain. We we, we always kind of, uh, you know, we saw him somebody who can, whom you can go and um, argue upon, uh, you know, speak about the game and tell him that he's wrong. I mean, some people always like to say, okay, let me go and tell you that you're wrong. You know, as a captain, I think I told off the captain yesterday, you know. <laughs> some people like it. So he was open for all these things. And he really worked... Uh, 
well with the team. So he used to come. Here, I think, the personal connection of Ganguly with the players was excellent. He never maintained this. It was just not about wickets, statistics, I mean the numbers, wickets and runs, wickets and runs. He never stuck to that. It was more to it. I think he was, he connected personally. He went out with them for dinners. He consciously made sure that uh, somebody doesn't perform well, he spent some time in the evening with these people. And, uh, you know, but even he, he never kind of underestimated anybody in that sense. So that's the reason why uh, I would say that uh, uh, Saura was probably a transforming kind of uh, leadership, what he did. And in our own Indian ways again, I mean, if you really see what Hansi Crony did to his team, and if you really see uh, probably the best captain like Steve Waugh did to the team, uh, that was different because they come from a very strong sporting culture. Whereas in India, we don't have that. So captaincy is all the more difficult. That's the reason most of them, for example, Sachin or Azur or somebody, they, they just stick to the guns and say, this is exactly what I need to, what, what needs to be done and this should happen. And what is ideal for me was, well, the ideal captaincy would have been was something like Australia or something like, uh, like, like English or even the South Africans. There is a unique style in these people. For example, the natural transition, how the leaders change. It always happens with a, in a, in a, in a style. I mean, there is no bitter feeling when one captain quits and goes to the, I mean, allows the other to come and take over. This is probably the best thing that happens in, in most of the teams. Uh, I would say, you know, <clears throat> we had Kapil and Gavaskar in their own eras when, um, you know, it was basically from the outside world and even to some extent in the inside world. I mean, it was basically north versus west. You know, these concepts, uh, these are the fundamentals or I would say these are the backdrop with which we kind of come up with zones. You've got to get over all these things when you play this game. So we, the legacy that was left behind for us, when you get into the team, south zone stick together, north zone stick together, east zone stick together. Now those things, I think when you see from the macro level, these are the ones which can destroy a team. I don't think, well, out of five games, you're going to win one. It is, uh, you know, it's just the statistics. I mean, your law of average, you've got to win some games, you've got to, but you'll be losing most of the games when you have these kind of mindsets. Whereas in Australia, whereas in uh, England, the transition, they named the captain two years ahead. Slowly, you know, the loyalties from Steve Wall transferred towards Ricky Ponting. So they are so sensitive towards the leadership. But the point in our team is that the leader, the captains will never quit on their own. <laughs> they will not. They feel that they are still good. I mean, as long as the captaincy, I think the problem with Sa Saura was the same thing. What Saurav did in the end was that uh, he held on to his captaincy than the game itself. He kind of ignored his own game and then held on to his captaincy. He always thought that, okay, if I'm a good captain, I mean, if I stay as a captain, I can always be a player in the 11. And that's the reason what he had to go through all this mess. And now I think he has come back uh, uh, as a better man. So the whole idea is that the transition of leadership is extremely important, I would say. I mean, till... Even now, to some extent, we don't know who will be the next captain. <clears throat> so that is somehow, I don't know about uh, how much of what I'm speaking is probably true to your own profession, but uh, that's what uh, the, the, the Indian uh, cricket team is all about. Um, <clears throat> one of the best ways I, would f I felt uh, during my period was that uh, the pressure where should the pressure come from? Should it come from the captain? Should it come from the juniors? Or should it come from the peers? I think the pressure from the peers is probably the best uh, kind of pressure to have. It's probably an extremely positive pressure to have on your side to, to do well in the, in the sport, in your profession. Once I think you lose self-respect with your peers, I think uh, that's where uh, you know, you, you don't feel like you you belong to that space. If at all a trouble has to brew from there on, it is because of your peers to start off with. And then, uh, you know, the rest. I mean, you all always feel that captain is a little cynical about you. You can always think about, you know, the juniors are a uh, little desirous about their position. They want to graduate quickly. But I think the pressure from the peers 
is probably the best pleasure in, in any sport for that matter. Um, we had uh, Sandy Gordon as one of the psychologists uh, who, who was hired uh, for the Indian cricket team. And he kind of uh, promoted few ideas in the side, which was very honest and uh, you know straightforward. You know because we have always undermined the uh, the presence of a physio uh, psychologist in the side. And uh, once we had him in the side during the World Cup, I think it made tremendous difference uh, to our approach in playing this game. Um, all he spoke to us about you know the self-respect, the self-esteem, and how do you uh, create that pressure from your own peers and uh, stuff like that. So <clears throat> uh, this is probably my understanding of leadership. I mean, there are a lot of positives. I think I, I picked up today the negatives of our captains mainly. That's because the positives um, are too simple. I mean, it is, it is too obvious. I mean, it is something which I think everybody has to do by default. Uh, there is there is no question of uh, saying that okay um, a captain has to be courageous captain has to be brave and all those things I mean that is it is natural I mean you you got to be all those things but how a captain handles the team under pressure what, what how does results bother the captain what kind of uh, how does it reflect upon the players while he is uh, losing the match I think is is extremely important um, with uh, as I said Sachin and Azhar. Uh, um, in brief, I think they didn't really reflect upon greatly upon the players when they lost. But whereas the plus point of Ganguly was that uh, even in loss, I think uh, you know he made feel that everybody was okay. And uh, best period, and these things can only translate over a period of time in in the form of results. And uh, that was pretty obvious. I mean, if you ask some of them, they will have their own explanation about why we lost and how we lost. But I think if you give four years. Um, you should be able to do that. Now, let's talk about Greg Chappell. Greg Chappell is somebody who, has, who is driving the team with the stature. I mean, um, most of the guys in the team, again, the same problem, is intimidated with him. They are scared of Greg Chappell. I mean, it is not possible for, for the boys to, to kind of perform uh, under such environment. I mean, you go abroad, you lose. In India, I think we don't need any Greg Chappell. We'll still win the match. I don't think <laughs> Greg Chappell is making a difference. I think the team is good enough to win in India. But I think the true story, I think, reveals only when we go abroad because it's foreign conditions and, and the wickets are different and you really require a lot of skills to play batting on those wickets. The bowlers will always going to do well and the batsmen is... Now, <clears throat> the, the, again, I think uh, the most common problem in, in the sport is that since everybody runs out of time, the last resort is for them is to be intimidating and then demand uh, workmanship from the people, and that that cannot happen. And uh, <clears throat> this is basically about my understanding of uh, you know the leadership. Um, so not necessarily the great players are good captains. Uh, he might be extremely good with his batting, he may be extremely good with his bowling, but um, somebody who understands the weakness and the strength of the players at the bottom level. Uh, are the ones who probably be more helpful. Um, but at the same time, I think everybody has their, has their own pluses and everybody has their own minuses. So this is basically what I wanted to kind of share my experience with you. Anything else you want to ask me, you can definitely ask me. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Srinath. Yes. See, um, over the last uh, few minutes, uh, certain interesting uh, thoughts you brought up uh, regarding our various leadership styles of our previous captains. Uh, what we hear and what we have heard over the last few days of leadership excellence in various facets of uh, other than sports, you know, the basic traits are very nearly the same. It's about connection, it's about, uh, it's about courage, it's about doing the right things, it's about uh, interpersonal relationships and all that. Oh, but uh, I, I want you to just um, you know re uh, respond on this point. See, we are a we are a country of 1.1, 1.2 billions, and um, what is it uh, you think uh, must be done to get some excellence in say winning some medals in Olympics or in Asian Games or something like that? While we may not have the sports culture and the kind of upbringing that would come about in an international arena. But, but we still should be able to do something. Maybe there is some teaming that can be done or some kind of, a, you know, 
uh, group activities where you synergize the teams into performing better, you know, cohesive manner and things like that. In whatever camps and things like that that would get done in a in the in the run up to tournaments. I think uh, <clears throat> you know I would probably go back to the same. Uh, we what you said. I think a lot of things do happen. And there is cohesiveness. There is togetherness sometimes. There is wonderful teamwork that happens. But the problem is consistency. Why can't we do this over a period of time? Now, some of our teamwork, some of our skills or techniques, whatever we have, is appropriate for the Indian wickets. Now, when we go abroad, it is not the same. Now, how do we prepare ourselves universally is, will be the question. Now, for that, I think you've got to have a, a real sporting mind. And that comes from the culture. Somebody needs to be thinking about playing for the country right from the age of 16, right from the age of 15. They need to belong to that space at a very early age. You know, be it athletics, be it football, be it cricket for that matter, anything for that matter. Now, for example, even tennis for that matter. I mean, we, we, why cricket is because I think it is one of the colonial legacy that was left behind by the Britishers and I think we take a lot of pride in beating them. That's the only one which has kept this game alive till today. You know, that's one arena where I think India as one can compete with the developed countries and then probably bring them down every now and then. I think there is tremendous pressure in that. That's the only one which is keeping us, um, you know, a little high uh, in this sport. But in the other sports, I think, uh, you know, the problem is that the lack of culture. We, we have very little, few things which builds us as a sportsman in this country. Um, Jeff Marsh, the, the, uh, the opener of uh, Australia, his son is a cricketer from the age of 14. He almost made it, but he still didn't make it to the Australian side. Like that, Shane Vaughan, McGrath, Ricky Ponting, they quit their schools at the age of 15 and they joined academy. From then on, it has been disciplined sport for the rest of their lives. Now, if we have at least 1,000 good players uh, identified and who gets into this space at a very early age, which is ideally recognized by the faculties of our society, this is a possibility. But I think uh, the parents always believe that education is the main. I think that's the problem with the developing country, I think. I think for us, education will probably give the most secured um, uh, lifestyle in the future. So I think we stick to that. And when you, st when you are a normal mainstream student, uh, having sport for one hour or one and a half hours every day, I don't think uh, it will give you that, that, that frame of mind when you reach the highest level. Things like this MRF Academy for cricket and such other things, they are not uh, nearly full time, they are all summer camps kind of well, thing about. The, see, the, we, we have some of the people, I mean, basically, you know, what happens, um, some of the sportsmen in, the, in this country use sport as an excuse. Since they are not good in education, since they can get team off, time off from the education, they use sport as education, they come and spend there. But I would always, you know, I always felt that if you are a good student, you can also play the sport well. But you know, it's a mindset which has to change within ourselves internally that you know, I need to become a sportsman now. Of course, education is the basic uh, ingredient which you require for the rest of your life. And if only if you have education, then you have analytical skills. You can understand yourself when you are in doldrums, when you are not doing well. It gives you, you know, proper understanding of the game when you are a good student. Uh, but the problem is when you don't have education, when you play the sport, that's again, you are playing with this extreme insecurity. And that's one of the problems what uh, uh, we have in the Indian cricket team. At the age of 18, 19, you give up your education, you go and play your sport. Um, getting dropped from the team, you would probably not take it in the right manner. Uh, you know, you start blaming the system and a lot of negativity comes into it. Uh, I can recognize a few names. Please put up your board as we have seen. Uh, uh, let me call on Mr. Madan Gopal. I'll go with the names. <laughs> yeah, so let me compliment Mr. <coughs> Srinath because very frank and uh, very, very interesting points which you have made. My question is uh, the present uh, the growing trend in the past three to four years 
of uh, regionalization of representation in the cricket uh, national team. <coughs> so we here as our uh, as a uh, fan of the, the cricket, I could see once upon a time six players from Hyderabad from Hyderabad in, incidentally in the, the national team, five play players from Karnataka. There no murmur, no no one w w was protesting on that. The recent uh, the trend uh, when I see. <coughs> Srinath, I'll uh, see him not as a Canadian, I'll, I'll uh, uh, see him as a representative of the country and uh, basically an Indian. But off, off late, if you could see when, when uh, uh, Sava was uh, dropped or uh, removed from the captaincy, even the members of parliament talking in the parliament about giving it a Bengali, you no know, discrimination against Bengali of, of, of the uh, recent incident where uh, so-called some Kalinga Sena activist or somebody attacking, uh, saying that it is a is for Orissa. Do you think it is the uh, uh, trend uh, to come in future? Because it's uh, very disturbing. Yeah, it's, this it's point number one. Point number two, two is that we could see in the past uh, the players in the team. Uh, they, they are from the streets. They, they no lack of. Uh, they didn't have training, they didn't have facilities, they didn't have uh, exposure. Now, now if you could see at our own uh, Bangalore Academy, uh, when Brijesh Patel uh, took me around, I was amazed. The, one of the, the best uh, training uh, facilities we have in Bangalore. I'm sure similar things are in many states. But why the brilliance is not coming? We could, we could see whether Azhar, Uddin or whether it is uh, Solkar, Rabid Ali, um, they, got the Jai Simma, they came from the streets. That though they may be having the training subsequently, but basically they came on their own, that natural players, what we call. Why despite this such a training facilities, why the brilliance is, still we, we talk of the achieving the brilliance, why? Uh, answering your first question about regionalism, I think which is probably a terrible system that has been followed uh, in the Indian cricket. I think uh, which is having selectors from different zones is probably one of the biggest uh, mistakes which uh, it's the part of the system and it is accepted. I mean, it's it's all about votes. It's all about uh, uh, you know the representations from different zones. So I mean, they believe that. Well, you can also see it from this way that you expect everyone. India is such a big country that zones. Uh, every zone has a selector, so he's supposed to see the games. But it, in the end, it, it it depends on the selector. If he's a nice man, if he's a if he's a very professional guy, he would rather do justice. Uh, in finding people and then accepting that somebody else in the other zone is doing well, so we, we need to give the chance. It has happened by and large most of the time. I think uh, when it comes to Indian team selections, it is about the 11 players. I think most of the time uh, you pick the best side. It's only those fringe players, the 12th, 14th and the 15th, and they are the ones you know, who get into this politics because the fringe players are equal in every zone. I mean, you, they're on par at every zone. So you cannot really, uh, you know, have, uh, to have to say that, okay, somebody is better than somebody else. I think that's where only the fringe players feel that, uh, you know, some kind of injustice is happening. But I think uh, usually the main 11, when the captain is involved, when the, when the coach is involved, I think they have a very neutral perspective towards the team. So that should not be a problem. So although the system is wrong, but you cannot really find a fault in the system. Uh, you know, in this regionalism, still I think cricket is a very clean system in that sense. Um, it will definitely uh, probably be there. I don't think it will change. But ideally, if you have three selectors or four selectors like Australia or England where you can go everywhere, professionally paid people who, who can take care of the game, I think that will be the best uh, situation. Now, coming, answering your second question. Now, having this game, see, in India what has happened is there is a disproportionate income uh, coming to the game. Now this is one of the reasons why the cricketers, especially the guys who make it to the international side, are suffering from the last two or three years. If you really see the statistics throws around 23 people made their debuts and out of which only six or seven are standing tall but the rest of them have gone. That's because at the age of 18 when you make it to the international level, enormous amount of money comes into the game. To the player basically. Now it is because of endorsements. I'm not compl I'm not against the endorsements, which is good. I think you need to have those. But do the boys have their have their drives enabled to understand this money? Do they have enough analytical skills, education, or probably the exposure to handle this money? Because they are paid 
by the you know the so called people uh, in the hope that he will perform well in the future but what that has kind of brought in the in the minds of the players is that they have they feel that they have achieved something i can give a, a small example of uh, parthiv patel uh, i think the fa father works for uh, the electricity board and having a small house uh, have, he had a, throughout his career he had a small house and they lived and it's a wonderful family when this guy played for india all of a sudden i think he signed a lot of contracts and stuff i mean cricket wise i think he didn't he was supposed to establish i don't think he has done anything you know, much in the cricketing space but in terms of people hope hoping that he's going to do well and then in a lot of contracts everything came in and there was a lot of flow of money into him so that was probably the biggest mistake that happened to his career all of a sudden he the, the entire the perspective of the people around him right it could be his own parents i mean they will be kind of uh, you know so i would say shocked actually i mean they would they, they start giving him that extra respect which he doesn't deserve i mean as a, it is just a father and son relationship so the whole world will probably change around him but his game still remains the same he has not really graduated to the next level similarly in the software industry now i think everybody gets stocks and shares and you know they make millions of but i think what they are worth at that particular point in time is that a lack of rupees of salary 50000 rupees of salary for that particular month but this shares and stocks and all those benefits that comes along gives gives them a different perspective towards life so same thing is happening in cricket now you know to some extent i think though, though there are a lot of talent that is coming up this is one of the threats around the international cricketers now like going a little deeper into that i think having the facility is one thing but i think the the mindset has to change right from the parents towards their kid and it is not that easy i mean it, i i can promise you that uh, even though you have the best facilities you know your talent has to match it has to align you got to probably perform at the right time and all those things will have to fall in place so <clears throat> we have you know we we always had people to play cricket now there are infrastructures coming up every uh, now and there um, but i think still we need to find a proper equation where we make sportsmen a thorough professional you know I, the ideal situation would be to run a school where cricket would be the major sport or major education kind of thing and you also teach Uh, the, you know you bring in the schooling concepts uh, into the into the sport that will probably be the ideal way of uh, doing things mr modkari yeah thank you very much for your excellent analysis of the leadership and you know managerial skills through concrete examples rather than you know dwelling on abstract uh, <clears throat> my actually question was very much related to the money aspect so you spoke <coughs> about how it affects the people who just come in but uh, our perception is that you know like there are people who keep lingering on Hmm. they don't want like you said about the power that the captain holds they don't want to leave the captaincy but uh, we feel that you know as a general perception they don't want to leave cricket and they, they want to be part of 11 or at least the 15 because you know, there's so much money hmm. otherwise the moment you get out there's uh, you know, like your uh, income comes <coughs> down drastically uh, i think i mean you are probably the only one who has retired gracefully i think most people just want to go on and on and on so how does that affect the game and what is your perception of that yeah, you know the, which is true uh, it all depends on how you see your career i think i don't think my career has come to an end i i still see the game through the media i still see the game as a match referee uh, of course i mean physically i think uh, i was probably not at my best shape at the age of 36 my motivation levels had dropped down so you got to take all these things and i always believe that when you leave the system you got to leave uh, uh, with some kind of uh, Uh, you know uh, you, you got to leave with some values behind i mean you cannot be sticking to cricket for various games i mean in india the problem is that if if numbers suffice you can still there be there for quite some time and it becomes an awkward situation for everyone and uh, well i mean i uh, in my case i think uh, there were two things i always felt that when you perf start performing below your own expectation levels i don't think you should be there and uh, i mean you can only play probably extra one year but i think uh, in that one year i could force a lot of things which will probably not be that good to me so that's the reason i had to quit um, but as you said i think different people have different ideas um, making money is probably not the only way i think engaging with the game with uh, proper terms is probably uh, which gives pleasure to some people 
and um, if if uh, if if money is the be all end all i think you saw what happened in 2000 i think they paid a big price for that so <clears throat> yes uh, it it again depends on an individual values his ethics about uh, you know how he has to play the game and things like that mr shrinivas oh mr shrinath uh such a uh, sorry saurabh's uh, success <coughs> coincided with uh, john wright's uh, <coughs> coaching yes. uh, appointment as a coach so uh, so you are not commenting on i wish no, you no, comment on that very the good second point, point is uh, as a connoisseur of sports and uh, cricket lover of cricket i find one thing very disturbing too much of criticism when the players do bad and too much of praise when they do well see Saurabh Ganguly hits a 98. <coughs> He's taken to the top of the world. I mean, the role of the media and how much influence it has in uh, spoiling our cricket. Right. Uh, the, the third point is, I mean, uh, unconnected point. I find some real raw talent blossoming in Pakistan. They don't have structured cricket like us, but they have talent coming up, raw talent which blossoms beautifully in the international level. I want you to comment on okay. this. Okay, starting from the Pakistan point of view, I think there are two things in Pakistan. one is politics one is cricket there are two things which you can come up i think people are uh, very much sure about that uh, these two aspects that's the most uh, pursued profession in pakistan and um, some of the other i think uh, they had some wonderful leaders to set uh, good examples for example i think the really why pakistan produces fast bowlers is because of one imran khan i think we don't have such idols uh, we lack such quality idols i think imran khan's values were tremendous I think he was a selfless man uh, when it came to the game. Uh, he did a great job for the cricket, and then he was instrumental in kind of handpicking. You see, when, as a leader, I think he believed in in creating leaders in the side, which was probably the Wakar and Wasims of of the of uh, Pakistan cricket. And he was never insecure because Wasim and Wakar was taking wickets. You know, that's an important point. I think the captain can never be insecure when somebody else bats well or bowls well in the side. I mean, uh, it is his ability to create uh, more of Saurabh Ganguly's, more of Sachin Tendulkar's in the side. You know, that is what his true leadership is all about, and that's I think uh, you know happens pretty well in Pakistan. Um, some of the other, I think, the lack of, I mean, the the wickets are so poor in India. You will never see fast bowlers coming up. That's for sure. Uh, you will always find difficult. Now, even I, I just want Sri Shant. I pray God that uh, Sri Shant, you know, holds on to it for some time and. delivers it because he has started off wonderfully now uh, your second question about the media as and the criticism the media criticism really, really doesn't bother because there are more number of newspaper medium newspaper than the news itself these days even the lot of channels uh, and everything so criticism becomes a part of it so one channel says something about a player the other will have to kind of put him down so that's okay but what disappoints is when our senior cricketers when our own senior cricketer starts criticizing our own boys you know in the in public well if at all if somebody has a problem i think if you really mean good to the cricket you will have to probably be one on one and then be constructively uh, critical about that player but uh, when you are when you when you kind of uh, so vocal about somebody's flaws or your opinion basically it's your opinion it is not even his flaw and you make it very vocal it because you are playing to the gallery at that particular point in time and uh, that's the reason i think uh, some of our senior cricketers has been extremely disappointing in that sense uh, you don't publicly criticize anyone and as a cricketer i think i can understand that when you are playing and then one of the top cricketers criticize you in media <clears throat> it is quite a dampener for your progress it is not only if if he is a real uh, uh, you know <clears throat> big name he not only criticizes the player but he will also seed his thoughts in the other's mind as well so everybody starts thinking okay because he has said that oh, this guy i don't think he is able to perform or he has this uh, problems with him so which is i think you know the problem is some of our ex cricketers still bask in their old glory the problem is when india loses the public perception is that yaar yeah, your guys when you were playing it was wonderful <laughs> but now it's not the best so this is something i think you got to give up the game completely and walk out of it 
You cannot be there. It is only for those 15 who are playing then. Once you're out of it, you're out of it completely. So that's what uh, the your second question. I think coming back to your first question, John Wright again, I think was a probably one of the simplest uh, coach I've ever come across. He was hands-on with the boys. He understood the need of each and every player. He made sure that uh, uh, you know the he worked with the youngsters all the time. He left alone the senior players. He didn't really uh, matter to him what the seniors because he knew that they were responsible enough to take care of themselves. And uh, he was always, a, 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 you would never hear of John Wright making an interview, getting into any muddle. I think we need somebody like that because otherwise you create another power center within the team where your loyalty keeps toggling between the captain and, <laughs> and the senior players and then you have another one which is uh, uh, the coach. I think that's the problem what we have now with Greg Chapel. Mr. Dan. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Srinath. You have very lucidly explained the traits of leadership and then related it to the cricketing arena. Uh, you, you also played uh, as a colleague with uh, Rahul. Uh, I have got, uh, I mean, one of my friend was uh, waiting for his uh, flight and Wasim Makram of Pakistan also happened to be there. So they engaged into a sort of uh, informal uh, communication conversation. And then he asked, Vasim Agram, what do you feel about the cricket team of India? And the observation that he made was, where is the team? It is only the individual brilliances, sometimes they come <coughs> into ashes. That's it. The team is not working at present. So what do you feel about the type of leadership that Rahul is providing? Probably because he is less assertive, so it is happening. Or it's happening, and then Wasim's observation is not like it. Now, a very valid point here again. <clears throat> if you see when the when the captaincy transition doesn't happen uh, in in the best form, you know, in a very ceremonial way, you have all these problems. Somewhere down the line, we connect to our captains personally. Forget about professionally, but I think personally. So that loyalty shift doesn't happen uh, in a smooth transition. There is some kind of distortion that happens. That is what you saw a lot. Or that's what you see now with, with this team. But I think Rahul is probably making his best effort. Now, Rahul is, I would say that he's, he's a learned man. He, he operates uh, you know, very nicely. And he has a style in operating his own uh, team. But I think uh, Getting to the grassroots levels, I think the problem what that has created here is another power center with Greg Chappell around. With Saurav Ganguly, it was uh, Saurav was used to take the you know, make the last call. That's his final call. I would take the decision. So the loyalty was attached to one particular person here. So usually there will be some kind of distortion around the team when there is an improper transition uh, of leaders. That's for sure. I mean, there is a lot of bitterness around. Zahir Khan didn't know where he belonged to. He was categorized as Ganguly's man. All these things do happen. So was Harbhajan Singh. He came in uh, public support of uh, uh, Saurav Ganguly, which was not called for. So they probably would not see Rahul as their leader straight away. It is the acceptance. I mean, they will have to play under him, but you know, that acceptability, the personal connection between Rahul and the boys would probably take some time before it happens. Now, I think that's a very sensitive area. I think uh, that's what when you when there is a change in leadership, a lot of bad things do happen and that's exactly what happened with the Indian cricket team. And um, Wazim Akram said, well, well I wish Prasim say something positive about Indian cricket. <laughs> um, no, I think he's a good student of the game, Wazim Akram, no doubt about that. But uh, I think I would see, uh, I don't know, I mean, Saurav is back again, so what kind of Equations to Saurav and Rahul and and uh, Greg Chapel, uh, who is in another entity now. Uh, I'm not being very critical about Greg Chapel, but I think I can. We can all see, see that he is an extra, is another power center that has been created within the center, within the team. So how this kind of uh, forms a proper equation, we need to wait and watch. So when you lose, obviously, a lot of things kind of flare up. Uh, but I think uh, you know there are times when you lose. Uh, the morale, the spirit of the team is still very high. So that, then in that case, the losing doesn't really matter. But uh, 
to be honest, I'm not really that close to the team anymore. Although I probably do some kind of media work from a distance, but I can't really get into that space and think for them. Uh, we will take the last three questions, <coughs> Mr. Arora. This is one of the most interesting presentations I've come across, the way you have uh, described various leadership uh, styles to you know, simple anecdotes. Now, taking this anecdotal part of your presentation a little further, I think uh, uh, it, it would be of interest at least to me to know, I mean, you know, in your career, when is it that you really, some, some instance <coughs> when you really felt at the zenith and some instance when you really felt at the lowest step. And secondly, you mentioned uh, the uh, captains with whom you've worked. I think Kapil Dev style you didn't describe, you might wish to. Also, I think some comments on some of the, uh, uh, you know, international uh, captains, uh, leaders uh, in contemporary uh, cricket. And finally, if time permits, you know, your personal view on this increasing uh, uh, activism by our cricketers on the commercial scene, your endorsement, I mean, one is not against it but it's perhaps getting too much. Thanks. Well, there is nothing wrong, sir. Going back to your last question, there's nothing wrong in people making money. I think it's, I think they are the ambassadors. I think they promote a lot of things. There is a good chance for this cricketer to be uh, idols for millions of boys. I think they can probably set the right values for the people because they have tremendous influence on the kids of the nation. I think uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And making money, I think, should be secondary. <clears throat> Nobody should really, but w care should be taken from the cricketing fraternity to make sure that the money is not destroying the desire, the hunger to play cricket uh, on a long run. That is something which is extremely important. I think that's, that's where I think the board should probably come in now. Because the, the background with which people come from is, is I would say, come a couple of them from extreme impoverished uh, uh, you know, uh, surroundings. Now, all of a sudden, it becomes total distraction. Money becomes a distraction for them. That's my only worry. But apart from that, I think they deserve to make money. They're in the right profession. If, if somebody is not happy with that, it, that, it means that he's not in that space, as simple as that. Uh, there's nothing wrong in pay, cricketers making money, but I think how they handle themselves uh, with that money is important. Um, now, coming back to, I think you asked about Kapil Dev. Uh, you know what happens when, when there are too many leaders in the side? I think everybody, nobody contributes. There is a fear of a conflict. I'm talking about my first year. So what happens? Everybody comes to consensus. There is no healthy arguments. Okay, you're fine, I'm fine, everybody's fine, that's it. Now I think that will hamper the growth of the team. I'm not saying anything harsh on somebody else. I don't speak reality. I'm going to be here for the next two years, so let me be good to everyone and walk out of the team. Now, that what, that's what happens when you have Vengsarkar at one end, Srikanth at one end, Ravi Shastri at one end, and Kapil Dev at the other end. So it was probably not uh, a, a best scenario. I think too many leaders in the side will always cause problems. And hearts of hearts, I think nobody endorsed each other very well. The strangest uh, you know, thing which we, I got to know in the close proximity of, of the seniors around was that we didn't see that same kind of positive energy what exists now with Sachin or Rahul or probably the relationship is probably far better with Anil or anybody for that matter. Although they have the little differences, that's fine. But the basic, I would say that everybody was too individualistic uh, when, I, when I saw them. And I think there is also, uh, as an youngster, when you walk into the side, you're very much eager to know more. And we seek that extra bit from, the, from our seniors. Now, we also become a kind of pylon onto the, to the seniors. Now, how they handle us is extremely important, and that creates an impression or probably a proper foundation for your future. So, you know, our um, um, psychologist, um, <clears throat> Sandy Gordon, you know, he put us into few uh, thinking modes. You know, he came up with a wonderful Tuckman's model and then said, you know, this is what we go through, which was very true. There are four stages, I'm sure, which you probably go through in our careers. One is the formation level, and uh, the second one is the, uh, which was that? Uh, norming, forming. Uh, the second one is the storming level. The third one is the norming, norming level, and the fourth one is the performing level. So he said, see yourself where you belong to. So when we walk into the site, you know, you're extremely made easy for the first couple of months. Oh, you're, that's the farming stage. You know, you are a wonderful guy and all these things. So your expectations are set to a different level. I think people are being just good to you. 
six months down the line or probably one year down the line, um, the reality creeps in. You don't get the same kind of encouragement. You are kind of, you feel that you are left out. That's because I think, you know, that initial honeymoon with the team players are over. Now I think it's the reality of the game. Now that is the storming level. I think the guy who will understand all these things and then quickly graduate to the norming level, where he understands, okay, this is the place where I need to be in most of the time is extremely important. So the team can go through these phases. The individual player, their own performance will go through these phases. So, you know, something like this, these kind of articulation at the entry level could have probably helped us quite a lot to understand this game better, to understand the mind frames of this better. We, we, we could have understood the, uh, the leverage that was provided to us or the lines not to cross beyond a line. But, uh, you know, that was probably lacking with our uh, system then. Whereas, if you go to Australia or uh, they had psychologists right from 1986, but we undermine them. The point is this, you know, we are probably the superior most, or the pioneers in technology, and we were the last one to implement technology into sport. 86, our president, our secretary, Lele said, Tera computer mere ko runout kar dega? Tera computer wicket nikalega? This is our understanding of technology into sports. You know, this is the secretary of the board speaking. Psychologist, oh, usko pad pena de, usko batting karne de. This is how the leaders of our uh, BCCI used to talk. Things have changed now. I think they have uh, understood, they have accepted a lot of things. So, you know, our, <clears throat> what I would say is that uh, my, I'm extremely uh, uh, optimistic about where Indian team should be. I think it should be probably with the money what we have today, the richest board in the world, I think we should be at the top. But what is that? I mean, they say, okay, we are providing the facility, we have the gyms, we have the best facility here, the ground, everything, but where are the boys? That is, the, where do the boys come from? It's from our own culture. Now, that is not an overnight story where you can create a lot of players and then bring them into the system. It's not going to happen that easily. So it's basically, the, the culture has to change. The cricket sport has to be seen as a profession. And then you will see a lot of positive things that is happening for India. With this Indian talent, what we have, be it any sport for that matter, if there is a proper professional setup, you can see a lot of gold medals, a lot of winnings that can happen for this country. I think, did I miss one of your questions or is it? So it depends on the time, otherwise we could speak during the break. I mean, I'll leave it to the chair. So this was, you know, was, uh, I think it will be of interest to know, I mean, which in your view was your greatest achievement and which was your <coughs> lowest point. I and think, your comments on contemporary uh, leaders uh, oh, they, other the countries. outside leaders i think uh, you know a system probably decides uh, the capability of a leader how strong the system is i think uh, will probably be the uh, be what the leader is all about i think uh, if if i would say that if india has a proper system uh, especially the indian cricket team um, I think it is probably done. For example, if you go to Australia, again, I, I, I am a big fan of Australian cricket. Uh, if you go to Australia, now the, who is the second captain? I think in, in one year's time, they're going to decide who will take over from, from Ricky Ponting. Now, they have academies in four places. They have a wonderful uh, structure. I'm talking about the domestic cricket structure, which is almost as good as the international cricket. So there is not much of a gap between the international cricket and the domestic cricket. So the guys who, who are successful in the international cricket, I think the domestic cricket, their graduation to the international cricket will take very little time. Because it's the same sporting culture that exists at the international level, at the domestic level, or probably in the under-17s or the under-19s. Whereas in our system, it's all different. So the leader who is in under-17 will not be much different to under-19, will not be much different to the under-21 or for the first class cricket or for the, um, uh, the international side. So I think uh, in a sporting environment, I think it's the system which really defines what a leader is all about. So most of the things he doesn't have to do in that case. I think people know their responsibility as a professional. So it is by and large, it's the system which decides what's the, what the leader is all about and how we should be leading. Now I think uh, the another captain who really missed the road, probably one of the best captain was Hansi Kronia. I think he got into something uh, really bad in the later stage and unfortunately had to lose his life. 
in a plane crash. But I think he was one of the best captains. Um, he was extremely transactional on the field. I think the way he kind of uh, uh, counteracted the uh, opponents and uh, the, the way he harnessed the talent from each and every player was good. I think the first thing what he did was he used to win the loyalty of each and every player. He made sure that he had the trust of each and every player. That's the reason he was treated as a demigod within the players. Even the senior most, like Dave Richardson, who is heading the GM, he's the ICC general manager. Um, although he was a lawyer and then much, much senior to, he said, I think, the, I, I would see Hansi as a, as, a, as a good leader because I think I trust him completely. I think the trust went too far after some time. I think that's where the problem was. But I, he was probably one of the best captains. I think Imran Khan was another exemplary captain. Given the context that Pakistani cricket was extremely difficult to handle, very rebellious group of people who play this sport. I think Imran Khan was probably the best captain. And uh, Steve Waugh, of course. That's mainly because of the system. You know, in India, in, in subcontinents, I think leadership is not that easy. It's very difficult in this subcontinent because our system doesn't really provide that support for you. <coughs> Rajini had a question. It seems to be showing in other walks of uh, life in the country also. That leadership is difficult, not only in sports. <laughs> My question refers to one of the remarks you made in the last answer, um, uh, like how you said that a lot, uh, the whole youth of the country, even those who are not interested in playing cricket, look up to all of you as uh, leading by example. How do you deal with this responsibility? And uh, secondly, uh, if you were not a cricketer but a parent of a potential cricketer, how would you influence uh, the upbringing of your uh, child? Well. Uh, <coughs> I think uh, in the given scenario, uh, 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 the influence of parents on the kids, uh, it's different in, in, in different. Uh, for example, if it is abroad, uh, when I was playing for English county season, I used to do some coaching where the players, where the parents, they look for accountability from the coach. What is that my son has learned from you uh, for coming for 20 days. <clears throat> what is the C, what is the perceptive change I have seen in his cricket? That's what they ask. But whereas the typically the Indian way of parents of asking is, will my son play for under 15? <laughs> so there is a, you know, the thought process has to be understood here. Has my son improved upon his game? Now you can give them a constructive feedback saying that, no, I think these are the areas which he needs to improve upon. So there is some, somewhere you can get, you know, give a proper feedback. When, when somebody comes and asks you, is my son playing for under 19 or not? <laughs> then you have a binary answer, no. <laughs> Which makes you a bad person straight away. <clears throat> now, it's a very difficult thing. I think in India, I'm not too sure um, if uh, in the future, if I have a son or a, or if a son to, to make him a professional. I think I would think twice before to do that. I would say, Education is important, side by side cricket. If you do it okay, if you come to a certain level, then it's okay. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, make sure that uh, you, you do that. I mean, I'm sorry I have to say this. I mean, this is my honest opinion. I don't want to say, give a rosy picture about, no, 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 the system is fine. There are academies, you can go, you can do it. In the current system, if somebody's talented, and if you have, if you're able to probably, you know, if you're in the right places at the right time, maybe the growth will be pretty quick. Uh, I think a lot of people, we have come through the same system, so I expect them to come in the same system. Uh, but I don't think uh, I can give a, a ready reckoner solution saying that if you do this, you will get there. If you do that, you will get here. I don't think that is uh, a valid one. Well, I, as a last question, I can't resist taking this opportunity to ask this question, which I've been wanting to ask for a very long time. Uh, which is about this mysterious thing called out of form and in form. <coughs> whenever a batsman hits a zero, they say he's out of form. And miraculously, he gets back form next. Is there really something called, <coughs> as a playing sportsman, is there something really called being out of form? And in form? I think, uh, which is very true. Um, you know, your body is evolving. I mean, you talk about out of form or in form, your body is evolving every time. Physiologically, you are changing. There is a psychological attrition the mental attrition that is happening in the mind because of the 
pressures what we all go through as cricketers. So, you know, it is only to remind you that, you know, there is something, one of the drives are not operating, so why don't we look into that? Yeah, that is in form, I think. You know, you've been successful, successful. What happens? That only breeds complacency over a period of time. No matter the best of best in this world become complacent at some point in time of their game, which means that one of the drives have stopped operating inside. Now, you've got to search which one is that. And that is a part of your entire evolution process. This is my belief. And then you go back to the nets, you keep working, you keep working. You do everything right, but still you'll be edging it. I mean, to the slips, there's nothing much that you can do. I mean, when it comes to the bowlers, I think you do everything, but I think, you know, bowling is all about the coordination of your upper body, the middle body, as well as the lower part of your body at, at the same time. So a microsecond delay in one of this will probably stray you down the leg side or whatever the undesired lens. So all these things can come with a little change in your approach towards the game. I think if you see Rahul or anybody for that matter, uh, for Rahul when he's out of form, he is probably a wonderful example to speak about. He thinks that what is my core competence as a batsman? It is solid defense. I should be able to defend any kind of ball. That is my, now he's been criticized for that. I mean, he's a little too slow and stuff like that. But that's his forte, that's his strength. So when he's out of form, all he does is come to the nets, defend, defend, defend solidly as long as possible. Similarly, the bowlers, I think all they do. And again, you'll have to wait for your time to come. I think, uh, you know, in that way, I think the God is extremely uh, calculative, I think. I mean, he will never give everything to anyone. I think he will probably test each and everyone at some point in time. What is important then is your attitude towards the others. When you don't perform well, what kind of support you get from your peers or from your seniors, that depends on what is that you have done when you were doing well. You know, that is, if you see the game on a long run, this is very much true. They give you a long run when you're out of form, if you have reflected very well when you are doing well. But if somebody is really arrogant and if he's self-centered, the rope is probably shortened when he's not doing well. So, you know, form and out of form is a part of everybody's game. And uh, it all depends on how quickly you can come back uh, you know, to, to your normal self and then start scoring runs. Thank you, Mr. Srinath. It's been a wonderfully stimulating session. Um, can I now request Commodore Rajguru to present the formal vote of thanks? And uh, we hope Mr. Srinath will join us for lunch. So, in case there are people who want to talk to us, and if you're free, please feel free to. Uh, I got uh, to go now, actually. I'm off to okay. Mysore. <laughs> All right, then can That's we. My uh, open, so I'm leaving like... this afternoon, so you've got to excuse me for the lunch. Yeah, would you please sit down here? We have a formal vote of thanks by. Thank you. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, when I, when I thought of speaking today, <clears throat> I knew that uh, I will be talking a lot of positive, negative things about our leaders, <clears throat> our predecessors. But I think that has to come up uh, at some point in time. I could probably be very nice in talking about who is good and what best he could do, but I think that most of the things, as I said earlier, is very, very obvious. There is no point in speaking about the obvious stuff. And, um, but I have high regards to all my seniors. And um, now that again throws black light on me about how good I was with my, uh, you know, fellow cricketers. So everybody has different opinions, and uh, all I did was, uh, you know, in an honest manner. But whatever I have said, that doesn't really uh, take away the respect for my senior cricketers and my fellow cricketers who are still playing cricket. So in the good interest of the sport, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It was wonderful sharing my experience. Respected Dr. Kasturi Rangan, Chairperson of this session, Dr. Sundar Sarukai, our esteemed speaker, Mr. Srinath, our course coordinator, Dr. Sangeeta Menon, members of the faculty of NIAS, and my fellow course participants. It's indeed a great privilege for me to stand here to offer a vote of thanks to Mr. Srinath, a very renowned sportsman of the country, an accomplished cricketer, commentator, and now a match referee. 
his excellent talk about uh, cricket, the so-called the great Indian passion, as you all know, was very, was very, very interesting. He also brought out that notwithstanding cricket being a great Indian passion, the Indian psyche and its view towards sports, more importantly cricket, as a profession. This is something we all need to mull over and see how we can improve sports and cricket in particular. You all agree that the most uh, interesting part of his talk was the case study way of uh, talking about the various leadership traits of our number of cricket captains and I'm sure we all can carry home some very, very valuable points from those and apply appropriately in our respective fields. Finally, on behalf of the faculty of NIAS and our, my course participants, may I offer Mr. Srinath our gratitude for an excellent talk we have had in our last seven days of our course. May I thank you once again and please join me in offering him a word of thanks and a big hand. Thank you. May I now request uh, Dr. Kasturangan to present the memento to Mr. Srinath. 